Thank you so much. Um, it's fun to be able to be here to share with you guys some of the stuff that my students and I have been up to trying to answer this really hard question. What is it that makes our mind so special? Just to give you a sense of what you're up for today, I thought I'd start by introducing this field that I study, this field of comparative cognition. I'm told that a lot of the folks in the audience are not necessarily practicing psychologists, so you might be a little confused about why I, a psychologist who's interested in human cognition, hang out with those cute critters that you saw on the first slide. So I'll try to explain why that makes sense and how that works. I'll also then tackle this hard question of what it is that makes human cognition so special. And I'm gonna do that in a funny way. I'm gonna start with a kind of strange story. I'm gonna tell you about a historic honeymoon, one that I think illustrates the power of our mental capacities in a very interesting way. And I'll use that to talk about the cognitive ability that I'm going to claim is responsible for some of the crazy, weird kinds of things that we do. And this is the idea that we have capacities, mechanisms, motivations, and some glitches that allow us to connect with other minds. I'll talk about two different kinds of glitches that lead to this sort of connection. One, a glitch that we share with lots of other species out there, and one, a glitch that might be unique to our own species, something that we alone do that leads to some good things and some not go so good things. And towards the end, hopefully I'll have time to wrap up, give you some open questions and so on. But with that first, this quick introduction to this question of comparative cognition, namely what I do. Why is it that I, a person who really cares about human cognition, why do I spend my time studying monkeys and dogs? This all makes sense to me because I've been doing this for so long, it's pretty embarrassing, but I find that it takes some folks some introduction to make sense of it. And so here's the introduction I'll give. I'll do it with a bit of an analogy. Imagine that you happen to be at a place like a conference. Like, this should be really easy imagination. This is not hard to do, it's late at night. But imagine you're at a conference, you're at a reception, kind of like the one that might happen after this talk, and you're just talking to new folks that you're trying to meet for the first time. You happen to be in conversation with somebody, you're trying to get to know that person. The question is, what are the kinds of things that you ask that person to get to know them? And this is the audience participation part. You didn't realize you were gonna have homework today, but you have to yell out your answers. What are the things that you ask? Okay, I heard it like twice over there and once over there. There's one thing I was looking for, which is this one. It's a question about where are you from. Some of you might have already asked that. I always, when I go to conferences, tally, I've been asked that four times talking to people in the last two days, right? Why do we ask this? We ask this because it matters. If I learn that you're from Boston or from Shanghai or from San Francisco or New York or from the very same street that I grew up on, it tells me something. It tells me something important about who you are right now, even if you haven't been back to that place for many, many years. Who you are depends a lot on where you came from. It helps me understand you in your adult state. The claim of comparative cognition is that if we're ever going to solve this big, hard problem, understanding this complicated thing that we carry around in our heads, we're gonna need all the tools at our disposal. And one of the fantastic tools we have is just this where is our mind from question. We can actually look to the origins of the human mind to make some sense of it, to give us some insight into how it works now by studying how it might have worked back in the day. Developmental psychologists do this by studying human ontogeny. They might look to the earliest stages of a child's development to try to figure out the answer to this big question of how the mind works. Comparative psychologists do the same thing, except they don't have the luxury of looking 20, 40 years or so back. They have to go a long way back. They actually have to go millions of years back because that is the scale of phylogeny, this big, rich question of where we were from way back in the day. And there's two kinds of problems with doing that when we really try to treat our species as a species that's a product of a lot of evolutionary history. Problem number one is that it's hard to get the resources to buy the thing you really need to do that research, which is a time machine. That would be very helpful for doing this research. And so you can't do research on the direct descendants or the direct ancestors that we would want to look at. You have to use a bit of a proxy. The good news is that we have this fantastic proxy illustrated here. It's all the other living species up there that are not us that provide this fantastic comparison for what we might have been like back in the day. They give us some insight into our common ancestor way, way, way back then. 
but they also provide interesting contrasting points, what we might look like if things had been different, if we weren't the way we were. The second problem with the approach that I have is not just that we don't have a time machine, it's that we have lots and lots of good windows, good comparison points for trying to target where humans came from. In theory, we could take this big radial tree of life and we could study any of the extant species on there. We could study any of the guys at the end of the branches of this tree. And that means we also need a lot of funding not for a time machine, but just to be able to study all those interesting species that are out there. You also need a lot more time than I seem to have had in my field so far. And so what we do instead of this is to try to come up with the best possible proxies of possible species that are out there. And the two sets of proxies that we have chosen to use in our lab are first the guys on this big, big tree of life who are most closely related to us. This is the small branch here represented by non-human primates, our closest living phylogenetic relatives. If anybody's gonna be a good comparison point for us, it's probably gonna be them because they're so closely related to us. And today I'll tell you about some work that we've been up to with one non-human primate species in particular, this guy right here, the rhesus macaque, an old world monkey species. We're lucky enough to study this rhesus macaque in a fantastic spot. This is the island of Cayo Santiago, which is right off the coast of Puerto Rico. It is, in fact, as beautiful as it looks in this slide here. It's filled with palm trees and so on. It's really easy to get undergraduate research assistants to join you at the field site. They're ready to go. Um, but it's, we go to it not just because it's beautiful, but because it's home to a thousand free-ranging rhesus monkeys who are very habituated to human observers to the point that we can set up cognitive experiments for the monkeys right out there in the field. And you'll see a few of these kind of ongoing. But this is one approach is to try to study cognition, our closest living relatives, and see the window that they provide. But there's another window that my lab has been using recently, and it's one that Susan alluded to in her introduction, which is to try to pick off this big radial tree of life, a species that can give us a different kind of insight insight into the kind of ways we got to be where we are, where we were from, because of the ontogenetic experiences we get. Because we live in a human society, we grow up in human homes, we hear human language and so on. There are not many species out there that have those same experiences, but luckily there's one that we can bring uh, into the lab and study, and it's that one little red branch over there, the domesticated dog. Some of you may have subjects of these in your homes right now, and so you know that they're there, sitting around, listening to language, being there around human artifact culture, getting the same kinds of experiences in a lot of the same ways as a human child. The question is, how does this shape their cognition? Does access to those experiences yield the same kind of cognitive abilities that we have as humans? And so to test this, as Susan mentioned, we've started Yale's first canine cognition center. It's this very cute dog-friendly lab on Yale's campus where we bring dogs from the community in, just like human subjects. They come in and they do their own little experiments, little problem-solving games and so on. And this really allows us to check how they think about the world and what they know. And it's quite fun for the dogs because they get interesting little treats and toys and so on. I'll also note, just in case you happen to be in the Connecticut area, that it's also really quite fun for a dog's guardians. They get to see dogs kind of do these tasks and see how their mind works. And your dog could graduate from Yale University. And so really, the, the better than subject payments is um, graduate degrees from Yale. And so, so this is the approach. This is kind of what I do. And, and, I use these tools to answer this big, hard question that I'm gonna focus on today. What is it about human cognition that makes us so special? And this is where I start with an observation, and it is still the observation that keeps me up at night. It's the fact that every single one of you guys in this room is actually really, really weird. We are just a weird species, and it's not just here in Boston that people are weird. We are weird all over, in part because we are constantly engaging in things that might seem mundane, but are that the kind of things that no other species on the planet does. Simple things like teaching, reading fiction, watching films, engaging in the scientific enterprise. We're constantly doing these interesting cultural things that we learned over the course of our evolution, that not over our evolution, but over our ontogeny, that require incredible collaboration across people, that are the things we just do all the time, but no other species is doing any of this stuff. It's really just us. And that raises the question, how do we get to do all these weird things? Why are humans so weird? Or from the perspective of a cognitive psychologist like myself, I kind of, why are humans weird? But 
what cognitive capacities allow us to be so weird? What are the things that let us be this unusual, strange species? The good news is that if you've been tracking psychology, all my psychologist colleagues in the room, you know I am not the first to pose this question. In fact, I am not the first to pose the question or lots and lots of answers to the question because there are many, many different proposals for the answer to like what makes us so weird. In fact, just in case there are folks in the room who think about these different proposals, many of you guys have even come up with some. Here's the kind of quick version of all the different cognitive abilities. It's basically a big long list of smart sorts of capacities that could be the kind of thing that separate us from the rest of the species out there. Today I want to put forward a slightly different kind of proposal. And it's different in kind because I'm going to ask the question not whether those kinds of smart sorts of capacities give rise to the weird things we do. We know many of them do in different forms. We could have lots of different talks on each of them. But today I'm going to ask a different question. Could it be the case that it's not just that there's some super smart human unique capacity like language or cultural learning, all these things? Could it be that it's not a smart thing that is making us so special, but a kind of not so smart thing, a kind of glitchy thing, a thing that's going wrong with the way that we represent the world, the way that our brains maybe represent the world, that gives rise to some sorts of errors sometimes, but some interesting human unique exciting, smart-looking things other times. This is the proposal I'm going to engage with today. And to do that, I'm going to start, as I warned you, with this crazy aside about a famous honeymoon. All right, so now you're going back not pretending, imagining that you're at a conference. We're going to do something harder. I want you to imagine that we're back in 1833 and that you are this guy here, William Henry Fox Talbot, out on his honeymoon. Anybody in the audience know what, Fo who Fo what Fox Talbot is famous for yet? No, okay, this will be a couple folks, but this will be good. Okay, so Fox Talbot is a British gentleman. He's gotten married to his wife. He has saved up finally to be able to go on a fantastic honeymoon that was delayed for a ton of time, but eventually he gets to go. He and his wife travel to this lovely spot here. This is the Via Melsi, which is off the side of Lake Cuomo in Italy. As you can see, it's like a pretty swanky honeymoon spot. It's looking really good. In fact, it's so swanky that if you're a nerd like me and you watch the bad Star Wars movies, you might have seen this in episode two. It's the spot where Anakin and Padme get married. And in fact, it was allegedly so beautiful that George Lucas chose not to use any CGI in the filming of it. He just kept it in its pristine beauty. So this is a pretty sweet honeymoon deal for an 1800s British guy who'd never been out of, the, of Britain, basically. But Fox Talbot wasn't really enjoying himself. In fact, he was pretty upset being on this honeymoon. He was there in this beautiful spot, and he was mad because he was experiencing all this loveliness, and he had no way to share it with anybody. Remember, this is, you're back in 1833. This is not where you can take out your smartphone and snap at Instagram. Like, Fox Talbot had no mechanism of capturing what he was seeing and seeing it with anybody else. Well, that's actually not true. He had the mechanism of his day, which wasn't an iPhone, it was this. This is the camera obscura, which is a mechanism where light can come in, shine an image on a piece of paper, and Fox Talbot could do what you see this person doing in this picture, which is use a pencil to trace out the picture. This was the Instagram of the day, right? But it wasn't like that good, as you might imagine, at capturing images. And so here's the image, uh, the famous image that Fox Talbot came up with. I see this, I think that's not actually that bad. That's pro that seems pretty good, but Fox Talbot hated it. He said that it was a melancholy to behold. This is not what you want to say about your honeymoon pictures. This is very sad. But it got him thinking. He wanted the images that he saw in his mind that he saw in the camera obscure to be shared with other minds. And it got him thinking, aha, maybe there might be some mechanism of getting these images to kind of durably stick on the paper. And he was a chemist and had lots of scientific background. It got him thinking of chemicals that might do this. And it led him to be one of the inventors of photographic paper and photographic technology. So you have Fox Talbot to thank for the ability that you can make Instagram pictures that are even better than the ones he came up with, all these things right here. Um, so Fox Talbot's invention got us in you know, not 200 years to switch from something like this to something like this. 
Why am I telling you this story? Well, I could tell you a story of fantastic creativity, fantastic technological innovation of the kind that no other species seems to have. But I'm telling you this story for a different reason, a reason that I think embodies what's weird about humans in a much deeper way. And that's the reason Fox Talbot wanted to invent the photographic paper. He wanted to do it because he wanted to get what was in his mind into other people's minds. And that is a really fundamental aspect of us. We are constantly trying to get the stuff in our heads into other people's heads. This is the reason Fox Talbot made his invention. It's the reason the greatest playwrights and novelists and movie makers have done what they have done. It also is the basis of so much of the technology we see today, things like social media and others. All of those technologies are interesting technological innovations, but at their root, they are trying to get the content of your head into somebody else's head. This kind of capacity is not just fundamental in terms of technology. It's the kind of capacity we see emerging in kids super, super early in life, not just when they start using social media, as is up there, but way, way earlier than that. Even within the end of the first year of life, you see kids doing their first version of sharing something on social media, sharing the only way they know how through their pointing. This is the kind of thing that neurotypical kids begin doing right after the first year of life. You probably have kids at home who've started doing these kinds of things. And if you do, you know that sometimes those points are about sharing, but sometimes they're about other things. So it's important to distinguish. Sometimes those points are not about sharing information. They're trying to get something out of you, right? And psychologists, developmental psychologists, have distinctions for this. They might call the cases where a child is not pointing to tell you something, but pointing to get something as proto-imperative pointing. Kids are trying to say, give me that with their points. And a lot of points are like that. But there are other points that are the kind of human unique kind, what we might refer to as proto-declarative pointing, where what kids are doing is not saying that they want something. They're just saying, Hey, look at that. Hey, share that information with me. And we know that through some of the fantastic, elegant work of folks like Mike Tomasello and his colleagues, a scholar who's written a lot about this issue of the uniqueness of human sharing minds. In this particular Tomasello and colleagues study, he was trying to see what kids wanted when they were pointing in this kind of declarative way. And here's the experiment. You take a young child, 14-month-old kid, you sit him in a chair right near his parent, and then you make something crazy happen. You just make some puppet pop out of the wall and do something interesting. And then kids will do what they naturally do, which is to point at it. Question is, what does a kid want out of their mom or dad? What do they want in terms of a reaction? What the hypothesis is, is kids want to share that information. They want not just for the parents to look at it, but the parents to look at the kid and say, oh, it's great, you know, I'm seeing this thing. And so to test that, what Mike did is he asked parents to give that reaction, the typical reaction, where you're really sharing information, or he asked parents to do something different. In one condition, they just looked at the object. So kids point and parents look at it, they say, yep, that's a, that's a stuffed animal, but they didn't look back to the child. In the other case, they did just the opposite. They looked to the child, they're like, oh, that's great, there's like this awesome stuffed animal, da, da, da. but they never made eye, they never kind of shared the information the child was doing. What you find is that kids will drop off the act of pointing over trials in both of those latter two conditions, suggesting that what they want out of this interaction is the sharing. They want you to be getting the content that's in their heads as well. And they're doing this just at around 14 months of age or so. And so it seems like human pointing is this powerful mechanism for sharing minds. Is this the kind of thing that's really special? Is this the kind of thing we might see in our non-human primate relatives? Well, it turns out that non-human primates, they don't really point so much, but they have a kind of way of sort of giving information through hand gestures. One of those, but none of those hand gestures seem to be of the declarative form, of the telling form. They're all kind of trying to get something out of you. And so one of my favorite examples of this is in the context of chimpanzees who do a thing that's called directed scratching, which they'll go up to a potential grooming partner and they'll say, they'll kind of use their hand in an almost pointing gesture to be kind of like right here. They're not saying like, hey, you know, let's both look at my thigh. They're saying groom right here. Like that's the, that is the spot that I want you to. So it's directed, but it's not declaring stuff. It's getting something out of you. It is functionally a kind of give me that point. And the claim is that we might be the only sort of species who's really sharing information for the act of sharing the contents that are in our head, to really get the contents of our head into someone else's. And so the question I want to address now is this question of why are we so weird? 
What are the kinds of mechanisms that cause us to do this? And I want to look to a particular kind of mechanism, because there are probably lots of different ones. They're probably really explicit, very strategic, conscious attempts to share this information. I want to actually look at the dumber reasons. I want to look at the stuff that's under the hood, that's automatic ways that we go about sharing information with others, that we go about kind of taking the contents of our head and getting them into another head. And what I'm going to argue today is that if you look at our species, it seems like we have a couple very automatic, very unconscious ways of doing this. I'm going to argue that we have one unconscious way that is not really special to humans. It's just the kind of thing that lots of species do, but it's also kind of comes from a bit of a cognitive glitch. It's not really a smart strategy. It's kind of this glitchy thing, but that lots of species do. I'm also going to argue, though, that there is one different glitchy cognitive mechanism that just seems to be us that does it. We're the only one that have this glitch, and it leads to all kinds of interesting good stuff as well as some interesting bad stuff. But first, let me start with this older shared cognitive glitch. It's one that if you've read social psychology textbooks, you might know quite well. It's just the simple phenomena of behavioral contagion, catching other people's behaviors. What social psychologists have found is that without realizing it, humans have lots of mechanisms for simply taking on the behaviors of others without realizing it. We're like the school of fish, where we're kind of constantly copying the behavior that other people are displaying around us, even in cases where we don't realize it. One of my favorite examples of this is what's known as the chameleon effect, an effect uh, that was discovered by my colleague at Yale, John Barge, and student Tanya Chartrand. And the chameleon effect is kind of just like what it sounds like. It's an effect where we are kind of like the chameleon, taking on the kinds of colorations in the form of behaviors that we see in others. And so in one standard example of a chameleon effect, you just have subjects, who's the folks, who's the guy in this chair over here, interacting with an experimenter. That experimenter is doing specific things, maybe having subtle behaviors like touching her face. And what you find is that unbeknownst to the subject, that subject will end up taking on those behaviors too even though they don't realize they're doing them. We're kind of subtly copying the kinds of postures and behaviors of all the folks around us. And this is embedded in a whole rich social psychology of to whom you do that. You do that more to higher status individuals and when you're trying to empathize with those persons, so on. But the key point is that it's kind of this dumb thing that we do. We don't realize we're just kind of copying automatically without realizing it. This is behavioral contagion, which kind of gets us into behavioral sync with somebody else. But what I'm talking about is more of a mentalistic sync. I want to see how you get into a kind of feeling sync with somebody else. And this falls out of behavioral contagion in that the act of copying other people's behaviors allows us inadvertently to wind up copying other people's emotions, a form of what we might call emotional contagion. How does this work? Well, my cheesy photo of the Celtics fans reminds you that when you're participating and experiencing certain emotions, you take on certain behavioral postures. You smile, you jump up and down, you do these things. But it turns out that merely acting those behaviors out can sometimes have a kind of converse opposite effect. Merely kind of smiling and displaying the postures of positive emotion can sometimes lead you to experience positive emotion, kind of classic social psych cases. The idea is that if we're going around copying other people's behaviors, and their behaviors that are displaying emotions, we might be getting those emotions for free. Whether those emotions are sort of happy emotions, like our Celtics fans, or maybe sadder emotions, which is really what the Celtics fans, alas, this weekend were showing. Um, props to the Cavaliers folks in the room, but in any case. But the idea is that by copying behaviors, we might be getting emotions for free. And so, the neat thing is that emotional contagion is really powerful. It's automatic, just like the chameleon effect. We don't realize we're doing it. We don't realize we're getting those emotions for free. But that also means it's kind of glitchy, right? It means that we're just going around and sucking up the emotions of other folks who are around us, merely behaving that way. And they might not represent the real emotions we want to feel. And that's the reason that when you kind of look at these cases of emotional contagion, they involve these behaviors that we kind of see as sort of funny or a little bit ridiculous. One of those behaviors, a kind of classic case of behavioral and maybe emotional copying, is the case of contagious yawning. 
So if I were to stand up here and continue yawning, or if someone in your row is finding my talk kind of boring, it's late at night, and they're yawning, you might, even though you're enjoying the talk, find yourself contagiously yawning as well. In fact, some of the most empathic of you in the audience may begin yawning, not because my talk is boring, but just because I have put this picture up. This is classic glitchy emotional contagion. Why are you yawning just because somebody else is yawning? It's just how the system works. Another kind of funny case of classical glitchy emotional contagion is what's known as laughter contagion. The mere act of seeing other people laughing or even more powerfully hearing other people laughing can not only cause you to laugh but cause you to experience humor. This is why all kinds of bad shows that aren't really that funny in the first place get you to think they're very funny by using what's known, as many of you know, as a laugh track. Just hearing people laugh helps you think things are funny. And to see this in action, I'm gonna show you a clip of one of the worst culprits of using laugh track in the modern age, this show here, Big Bang Theory. And I'm gonna show you how funny the show really is when you take out the laugh track. And there's wonderful YouTube channels that do this. It's called Big Bang Theory No Laugh Track. And you'll see, like, it's just not that funny. And so here's just a quick clip so you can see this in action. Ah, nothing makes beer taste better than cool, clear Rocky Mountain spring water. Where are the Rocky Mountains anyway? Philadelphia. Really, I thought they were out west someplace. Think about it, Raj. Where did the movie Rocky take place? Philadelphia. OK, now I get it. OK, it's just not, fu I mean, it's not funny at all, right? <laughs> but, but, if, but if you plan that track playing, you guys might have all been laughing, which is an interesting experiment. But this is the point of emotional contagion. It's kind of automatic. It is dumb. It is glitchy. And just as a pause on the kind of public version of this, but just to kind of give my neuroscience colleagues a nod, I think we understand a little bit of how the glitchiness of some kind of these things work by turning to the neural structure of why these kinds of behaviors come into place in the first place. And it's a kind of accidental glitch of the way brains are organized, this sort of odd phenomena of neural resonance, this idea that we just don't have that much brain real estate. So sometimes you have to stick different processing in the same spot and when you do that, those processes get confused. And what we know is that certain areas where we process things like pain or things like other people's actions and so on, there's some spot where we process that for ourselves, where I experience my own pain. But because the brain is a tight resource, we sometimes use the same reasons to process other people's pain and so on. This gives rise to an easy way to get confused between your own behaviors and other people's behaviors, your own emotions and other people's emotions and so on. So just the glitchiness actually has a really obvious neural component here. It's just like an accident maybe of the way that brains are set up. But that was my kind of quick taunt to neuroscientists. What I really wanted to spend my time on is this question of, okay, could this explain all these cool human unique ways that we go about sharing minds? Is this glitch the culprit that leads to all the human unique stuff? And the answer in this case seems to be no. In part, neuroscientists in the room might realize why. We know there are areas that work kind of like neural resonance in non-human animals, particularly non-human primates. But we also know the answer from the behaviors of non-human primates and other animals too, because they show exactly the kinds of glitchy things, the glitchy behaviors that we have as well. And so there are a couple examples in chimpanzees. One of my favorite ones is the fact that chimpanzees also show contagious yawning. So if there are chimpanzees in the room out there, they also might be thinking, my talk is seeming kind of long and boring right now. Um, here's just a quick video um, from an experiment by Franz de Waal and his colleagues. This chimp is watching other chimps yawning on, his, on this little iPhone. And you can see how chimps react to this. They're kind of watching and not really getting bored, but they're watching this. And <laughs> even when they're picking their nose, they're kind of <laughs> experiencing this as very, very boring. Um, we also see contagious yawning, interestingly, in dogs. You can try this one at home. Go home, sit around, be really tired in front of your dog. You might see dogs showing the same kinds of behavior. So contagious yawning in non-human animals. We also see something akin-ish to contagious laughter in non-human animals. Um, chimpanzees don't necessarily laugh, but they have this vocalization that they do when they're being tickled that's kind of like a uh, sort of laugh. Um, here's what it sounds like, just so you can get a sense. <laughs> So it's like, ah, ah, ah. 
But you can analyze whether or not the uh, of one chimpanzee actually transmits to others. And this is exactly what Davila Ross and colleagues did. They analyzed footage of chimpanzees playing and statistically figured out that the act of kind of vocalizing, laughy vocalizing on the part of one chimpanzee would seem to transmit to other chimpanzees. The claim being that you see something akin to laughter contagion in chimps too. And so the fact is that it seems like emotional contagion may be a really powerful mechanism for us sharing minds, but it can't be the only thing that is at work in the kinds of human unique sorts of sharing that I was talking about. The thing that Fox Talbot and we do all the time with Instagram, that can't be the only culprit. So where can we look for another one? Well, if we go back to my outline, what I'll claim now is that there's a second equally kind of weird and dumb cognitive glitch that we had that really is only ours, that really is the kind of thing that we alone as humans do. And unlike behavioral contagion and emotional contagion, this doesn't have a long history in the field of psychology. But it's something that I want to kind of christen here as a form of mental contagion, kind of contagiously catching the mental states of other people. And because I'm a nerd and it's I get to christen it because people haven't talked about it in this form before, I'm going to christen it with a much nerdier name. I'm going to call it Mind Melt. And everyone who laughed, I know that you're a nerd like me, so thank you in group bonding here. Um, those of you who are laughing know where this term comes from. It comes from the TV show Star Trek and a phenomena in the show that was known as the Vulcan mind meld, a mechanism that Spock and other Vulcans like him could use to kind of mind read the thoughts of somebody else and to kind of have their thoughts be one with somebody else. And just for the uninitiated in Star Trek, um, here's a kind of quick video of what this looks like when Spock mind melds with somebody. Our minds are merging, Doctor. Our minds are one. I know what you know. It's all very cheesy and they have the 70s music and it's great. But the, the thing I want to claim is that yes, there's this Vulcan mind melt, you gotta grab somebody's head and you need special alien powers to do it. But the amazing thing is that there also is an equally powerful human mind meld and we don't have to go through the fanfare of grabbing anybody's head to do it. We just get for free what other people know and what their perspective is and what they're thinking. Let's just go back to my kind of sad Celtics fans here. Yes, you might be copying his behavior, you might be getting their emotions for free, but you're also doing something really powerful, which is that you're separately reading all kinds of things that are going on inside these guys' heads. Things that you might not think yourself. You're reading this, you're instantly getting access to this guy's attitudes about the Celtics. You're instantly getting access to this guy's beliefs about whether the Celtics are gonna win. His predictions about what's happening, his intentions and desires for this stuff. You just get access to that for free. You don't have to grab his head and be like, I know what you know, Celtics guy. You just get it. This is the power of our human theory of mind, something that psychologists have studied for a very, very long time. But I want to pose a separate question, which is, do we as humans also get this kind of second part of the mind meld? Not just knowing what somebody knows, but really having a case that the act of doing that causes your minds to be as one, causes you to get confused about your own beliefs and the other person's beliefs, a kind of contagion of mental states. That's what I want to ask about the context of mental contagion. Do we see any evidence for stuff like this? And it turns out, if you look, there are a couple cases where it looks like we kind of just get confused about the content of other people's heads. One of my favorite examples of this comes from the cognitive psychologist and neuroscientist Ian Apperley and his phenomena of altercentric interference. What is this? Altercentric is kind of other-centric. It's other people's perspectives messing with yours. And to see this in action, I'm going to have you guys take part in this task. Here's gonna be your task. I'm gonna flash on the screen a bunch of red dots, and your task is as quickly as possible to yell out the number of red dots, and you all have to do this as quickly as possible for it to work. You might see other stuff on the screen too, because I'm a psychologist and I'm gonna mess with you, but you ignore that. Your task is just to yell out the number of red dots. Everybody ready? All right, here we go, ready, go. The clicker is making this easier a little bit. Okay, good. Um, I think we saw a little bit of the phenomena. So 
you're probably noticing that it wasn't just red dots on the screen. There's this other thing on the screen. What's going on, right? What's going on is I'm trying to see if your answer to the number of dots is affected by what that two-dimensional stick figure avatar on the screen is looking at. And it turns out there was a couple examples of this in the audience of cases like this kind of feeling a little faster when you have to say two and the avatar is also thinking two, then of cases like this where you have to say two, but the avatar only sees one. It's kind of a little bit harder, should feel a little harder, almost like a stoop effect for a psychologist in the room. And when you measure this carefully using reaction time, what you find is that this is exactly the case. This simple task of just saying the number of dots you see on the screen is affected by what this avatar sees, what number he sees in his own perspective. And this isn't like a real world person that you care about. This is a two-dimensional stick figure on a screen that I told you to ignore. But his perspective is messing with the speed with which you can report your own answer to this question. We also see, in addition to something like alter-centric interference, some, although somewhat controversial cases, of what we might refer to as something like belief interference. Not just somebody else's perspective interfering with yours, but somebody else's completely different belief interfering with yours. Something that you think somebody is thinking something false, they don't know what's going on, but that representation messes with your own. I'll tell you one version of the belief interference study that was done by Agnes Kovacs and her colleagues. She ran this study not just with human adults, but also with human infants, kind of see where this phenomenon came from. And she was able to do this with human infants because we have good mechanisms of asking human infants when they can see different numbers of objects and what they expect about different numbers of objects. We can kind of do a little magic trick where we put objects behind barriers, and if when we remove the barrier, the object's gone, babies are known to look longer at events like that. And so what Kovacs and colleagues asked was, is a baby's own representation of where an object is affected by what somebody else thinks? If the baby has accurate information, should totally have a true belief about what's going on, can their own representation of the world get messed up when somebody else has a false belief, when somebody else thinks something differently? And the somebody else in this case is going to be that little blue smurf you see on the screen. Again, this kind of strange avatar. But what babies see is the following video. You can see the baby's reaction uh, in this video here. Babies are watching as they and the Smurf is watching, objects going behind that little green screen. And the baby gets privileged access to the fact that while the Smurf is gone, the object is actually leaving. So the baby should think there's nothing behind the screen, but the Smurf should think there's something there. And what Kovacs and colleagues do is they drop the screen, and there's nothing there. And they ask, are the babies surprised? Are they showing longer looking? And you're seeing what the babies in her test did, which is that they looked long as though they themselves had the belief that the object should have been there. They seem in some tense to get confused on the basis of the other person's belief. Now, this experiment was published in Science. It was written up as really early evidence that babies could track other people's false beliefs. But I think it's a powerful example that from a very early age, babies aren't only tracking other people's false beliefs, they're getting them confused with their own beliefs to some interesting extent. And so the claim that I want to use these studies to make is that there seem like there might be some evidence for something like mental contagion, something that's automatic that we can't control, that's hard to shut off, something that's glitchy that gets us the wrong answer. And again, with a slight nod to my neuroscience colleagues and the kind of open question, I'm not sure what the neuroscience evidence tells us about this one. It's a little bit weird. But there is something we know about the mechanisms we use to represent other people's mental content. It seems to involve this really rich neural network that seems to also represent other cases where we get out of our own head, cases where we're thinking about the future us, or the cases they're thinking about counterfactuals. The claim is that these kinds of processes take a lot of work. They take a lot of inhibitory control. It's hard to hold on to what you believe about the world at the same time as you're thinking about what somebody else believes about the world. This is why we have to recruit regions like the RTPJ that are so involved in inhibiting this kind of information. The claim is that it's just hard. Sometimes we mess up. Sometimes the act of keeping these things separate don't work. And like other sorts of memory errors, things like source memory errors and so on, we kind of just get the information confused. The act of that is contagiously taking on this other person's mental content that you are representing as your own. And so we know that this is kind of glitchy, it's automatic, we see it in these hints in humans. Is this the kind of thing that's evolutionarily old? Can we see it in other animals? 
And this is the spot where I'll give you some recent data that we've been using to try to look at this sort of question. Really, we've been trying to do exactly these kinds of questions with non-human animals. And I'll remind you that non-human animals are pretty good at taking other people's perspective in some contexts. For example, we have work showing that non-human primates are pretty good at knowing when a person's perspective would let them deceive you. So if you're this monkey trying to figure out who you can steal that little purple grape on a platform from, you're pretty good at this task. And you know that person who's looking away is a pretty good target. So good, in fact, that on the first trial, you're going to get it right and steal from her. So monkeys are pretty good at tracking this. Do they show the kinds of biases we were talking about? Do they show something like belief interference. This was the question that I asked with my former student, Alia Martin, who's now a professor at Victoria University in New Zealand. And what Alia did was to use the fact that we can test monkeys in some of the same ways as we test human babies. We can use their looking as a measure. Here's just kind of how it works in the field site. You have one person who's acting as the agent. They're kind of like the Smurf. You, of course, have the monkey who we're filming. And you have somebody behind the monkey who's videotaping how long the monkeys watch. And so we get data that look a lot like those baby data. We could ask whether the monkeys are surprised on behalf of what the person believed. And here's Alia's version of this test. Alia is kind of watching this interesting object moving across the stage, kind of just like the Smurf. And she's going to see the object do all kinds of things. I'll tell you in a second what that looks like. But all of the cases where the object moves are going to end with that box on the right flipping over and being empty. So it's always going to be empty. The question is, did Alia think it was going to be empty? And did the monkey think, based on what the monkey saw, that it would be empty? And so here's just all the conditions at once. We sometimes, because we're good counterbalancers, have cases where the monkey and Alia both see the object move to the other location. So when that box on the right opens, that's totally boring. Both the monkey and this agent have a true belief, so that shouldn't be surprising at all. We also have cases where both of them should be surprised. So both Alia and the monkey are watching. It goes in that box, and then all of a sudden that box falls and it's not there. So the monkey should be surprised. He has a false belief, but so does Alia. And then we have the more interesting cases where Alia and the monkey's ideas differ. We have one case where Alia sees it go in, so she should believe it's there. But when she's not paying attention, it goes to the other spot. So this is like the video you just saw. So when it falls, the monkey should be like, that totally makes sense. But Alia should be shocked. This is the critical condition. And since we're kind of counterbalancing everything, we also have the case where Alia sees it go to the other spot. So she thinks it's empty, but the monkey sees it go back. So when it falls, the monkey should be shocked, but Alia shouldn't. All the conditions kind of make sense? Not? OK, here's what we find. I'm plotting on the y-axis how long the monkeys look, in some sense, how surprised they are. And you're seeing two interesting effects here. One is that the monkeys do get surprised when their belief is violated. When they thought it was there and it's not, they look longer. But their expectations are not affected by what Alia thinks. They're not showing the same pattern as these very young babies that we tested. We also wanted to do the same sort of thing, not just with belief interference, but maybe with the simpler task, is what the monkeys kind of answer in terms of their expectation is to how many objects they're affected by what the person thinks. And this is work that I did not just with Alia, but my fantastic student, Lindsay Drayton, who is leaving Yale's PhD program to now be editor-in-chief at Tix. So if you want to get a Tix paper and be like, I saw your wonderful study at APS, and that's <laughs> key, key feature there. Uh, but here's what we did. We basically, it's so hot off the presses, this study, I didn't even get a picture of it. But imagine we did a version of that same sort of thing, kind of like that altercentric interference study. And so what we do is we habituate the monkeys to a person sitting there. There's two objects on the stage, and the person is looking at one. They get this sort of situation over and over and over again, and then we switch it up. Either we just move the objects, but kind of everything's the same. There's still the same number that the monkey thought, the same number that the person thought, the agent thought. Or we switch it up so that the monkey's perspective changes. Now one of the objects has disappeared, but the person's perspective is the same. Then we do it again, we're kind of good countermalancers, where the monkey's perspective is the same. They still see two objects. Their answer is still the same. But the person's perspective changes. And because we're good counterbalancers, we do it where both perspectives change. And again, the question is still just the same. We're going to ask whether the monkey's expectation about the number of objects is the same. Do they get surprised when one object disappears? And does their answer change, or the speed of their answer change, when the person's answer is different? Kind of just like the task you did. What would we find? Well, it's the same sort of pattern we saw in the case of beliefs. The monkey's own perspective matters for their looking. They look longer when their perspective changes. When it was two before and all of a sudden it switches to one, they increase their looking. But the magnitude of that increase doesn't depend on what the person thinks. 
Ergo, we are just not seeing something like altercentric interference in the monkeys either. So what does this all mean? What we're finding so far is this form of mental contagion, this act of simulating somebody else's mental content and kind of getting confused is not present in other primates, probably just because they don't simulate other people's mental content at all. They kind of just can't do this thing that we do. But the fact that we do it leads to these interesting glitches. It leads us to mess up our own content versus somebody else's. So far, I've only shown you these kinds of glitches in the context of these kind of funny cognitive psych studies, where it's just messing up how quickly you react and so on. Do we see these glitches playing out in real world contexts? Mind you, these are cases where other people's mental content is messing us up, so much so that if you put a monkey or a chimpanzee in the same study, they would look better than we do. And so do we see any cases like this? And I'll end by arguing that I think there's one case that makes us look pretty bad by comparison when we look at how other species deal with other people's bad behavior. And it comes in the context of a now very famous study by Victoria Horner and Andy Whiten. And I'll let you, for those that haven't seen the study before, kind of experience what it's like. So imagine you're in this study and your task is to figure out how to open that puzzle box. You don't know anything about this puzzle box. You might mess with the thing on the front or you might do something at the top. That might be one condition. But you also have information. You have Vicky showing you her idea, her mental content, about how to open it. And here's Vicky doing it. You can see Vicky doing the study. This is the one with chimpanzees. She's showing the chimp how to do this, and the chimp's like, aha, I guess you push those things out of the way, and once you do that, you stick this stick in. This box is way more complicated than we thought. But then after you do that, you can open the front door, and you can use the stick to get out a tree. The first thing that this study found is what you're seeing here, which is that chimps are actually pretty good at copying when they don't know how to open the box, when they need the person to help them. In fact, they copy pretty slavishly, one of the elegant examples of cases where non-human animals imitate pretty well. And they do that, and they're able to get out a tree. Pretty good. Um, you might not be surprised to hear that human children can do the same thing. If they see that same display, they also very painstakingly copy really carefully. And this all makes sense because they don't have their own belief about how the box works. It's hard to figure out. They have to use the desires and the beliefs of the other person in this case. And they do that quite well to get the thing out. And so all this seems to make sense. This is not a case of glitchy sharing. This is useful. You don't know how the box works. You see somebody do it. You're like, aha, this makes sense. That's how the box works. But what if you didn't need the other person's beliefs about how the box works? What if you had your own? What if it was just an obvious box and it was really obvious how to solve it? What if the box was transparent and you could see that the only thing that mattered was that front door, the rest of the box was just empty air? You could probably solve it pretty quickly, but would you get messed up by that same content that somebody else had? Would you get messed up if somebody in their behavior has expressed the belief, aha, this is how you open it, you do all these kind of weird things? You might think not, but then you might not have been listening to the whole part of the talk where I explained that our glitches sometimes make us look dumb. So let's see what really happens, and since this is Vicky's study, I will let her explain to you what she found. The second box that I show the chimpanzees is this one, and it's identical to the opaque box, except that it's made out of material which is see-through. Only now is it obvious that the tapping and poking don't achieve a thing. The box has a false ceiling. All right, so first question is, will chimpanzees be fooled by this? And you're all smiling, so you probably guess they're, they're not. But just since chimpanzees doing things are cute, I will show you what chimps do. The chimps cut to the chase. They skip the needless steps. For the apes, it is all about the treat. It makes sense, you know, natural selection, shouldn't design these organisms who do really dumb things, who, you know, just happen to see somebody do some bad behavior that illustrates the wrong solution. It shouldn't, like, mess us up, right? Um, but the sad thing for humans is that seems not to be the case. It might be that the power of our glitches over help mess us up even in these real world contexts. And because it's funny to see kids doing dumb things, I'll show you what kids do. We found something quite surprising. The children were predisposed to copy 
even when it meant that they were doing something that was really rather silly. So this seems a little like the chimps are outsmarting the kids in this particular study. There he is. You got him out. And so the claim is that it might be something about the fact that we're so good at representing other people's mental content and the fact that that process is kind of in beta testing, it's a little glitchy, that seems to mess us up in the context of these problem-solving studies. Now, if you were here this morning and you went to Christine Laguerre's fantastic talk, you'd learn it's more nuanced than kids messing up all the time, but it's nuanced in a way that might allow for some of these sorts of glitches to kick in. At the very least, we're doing something that seems much worse than other species. And the sad fact that I'll end with today is it's not just chimpanzees that seem to be better than us. It also seems to be man's best friend, too. We decided to test dogs on this problem-solving study because we thought, well, maybe chimps won't fall for our bad information, but our dogs, you know, they love us. They, they're the kind of species that might be really motivated to track our information, so much so that maybe they have these kinds of glitches, too. And so to test this, um, we teamed up with two fantastic students, Paul Holden, who's an undergrad, and Angie Johnston, um, who's basically running my dog lab. She's a truly fantastic grad student. Next year, if she applies to your program, you should hire her, because, like, seriously, she's super amazing. And what Angie and Paul uh, designed was a kind of dog-friendly box that had a part that was relevant, that red lid that you have to lift up to open the box, and a part that was irrelevant, that stick on the side that you can kind of see is attached to nothing. And so Angie or Paul would demonstrate for the dogs how you open the box. Just like in that other case, they would do this sort of irrelevant thing. They would wiggle the stick. And then Angie would do the relevant thing, namely open the lid. And the question is, does seeing the kind of messy version, seeing Angie's mental content that doesn't make any sense, mess up the dogs? And so here's a quick video of what this looks like, kind of dog testing our lab. There's Paul with Pixis, who's the dog. He demonstrates the irrelevant thing opens the lid, which is the relevant part, gives the food to the dog, and then importantly, just like in the human studies, he leaves the room, and then we can see what Pixis does, basically making us look terrible. Pixis also doesn't fall for it. And so the claim is that some of our glitches, perhaps this glitch of being able to represent other people's mental content, this mind meld where we don't just know what somebody knows, what other people know affects us. This could be uh, the kind of thing that's not just true in these kind of funny cognitive psych tasks. We could be seeing seeds of it in real world problem solving. So we have to take the kind of good part of our glitchy behavior, gives us interesting cultural learning with some of the downsides as well. And so what we're finding is mental contagion seems to be unique. It seems to be the culprit. Okay, so finally, just quickly to wrap up, because my time is going into the yellow here, so that means I should probably wind down. What I asked was this question of what is it that makes human cognition so weird? Why are we doing all the stuff that no other species does? And I didn't want to give all the other answers that are just kind of like, it's just because we're smarter, it's because we have language, it's because we have self-awareness, because we have all this stuff. I wanted to take seriously the possibility that maybe we're weird because our brains are doing something dumb. Maybe we're weird because our brains have these interesting cognitive glitches that look good in some contexts, namely the context where we're accurately sharing information, getting the content of our heads into somebody's head in a way that no other species does, but that has these funny cases of being a little glitchy. And I've argued that there are two glitches, one that's not just us, you know, so we don't have to be that embarrassed, one that we see in other animals, but one that seems to be human unique alone. We share our emotional contagion with lots of other species. They also have that mechanism of getting into other people's heads that will also lead them to look really dumb when there's a laugh track. But we alone might have this problem of mental contagion, of kind of taking on the thoughts of others when we don't even realize it. It looks dumb in the context of those problem-solving tasks, but it's also probably the thing that allows us to do all the kind of cool, uniquely human things that we do. And with that, I will end, and this is my permanent thank you slide because I get to be this monkey that doesn't do any work and just comes to Boston and talks to you guys and acts like I did all this amazing stuff. But the rest of those monkeys are my lab and my lab members who are doing all the hard work and working really hard so I get to act like the science was always easy and fun. And you've heard some of their names already, but let me just thank them again and all the folks that funded it. Thanks so much.